The Arizona Child Fatality Review Program was established in the mid-90s to research and prevent causes of child deaths. This year's report detailed a shocking 171 percent increase of firearm-related deaths among children over the past decade. Joining us now to discuss the findings of this report is Executive Director of the Arizona Public Health Association, Will Humble. Will, welcome back. Hey, Steve. Thanks for the invitation. So let's talk about what I'm going to call a three-legged stool, um, right. three categories that describe how kids of different ages passed away and things we need to watch out for. Yeah, there's if, if you break down the childhood from zero to 17, there's really three distinct regions when it comes to preventable deaths, and that's what we're focused on, on things where there was a preventable, there was an intervention that could have been in place to prevent that death. Uh, the first is the infant and very young kid stage, and that that the leading causes of death um, in Arizona in, in, in the report are really suffocation and drowning. So the suffocation is really with the infants, and that's the, the intervention there is to make sure kids go into their own crib on their own with no pillows in the crib, and you lay the baby down on their back to sleep. Resist the temptation to bring them into bed with you. If you're breastfeeding, sometimes that's, oh, well, I'm going to bring the baby in with me. That's a super unsafe decision. And so for that, for that little baby phase, it's really safe sleep environments. And this is an important report because it, it, it tells pediatricians what they can talk about with new moms and new dads. And number two? And, and, the, and, and then it's drowning. And everyone knows, watch your kids around water. It's a refrain. I don't think there's a single viewer that doesn't know how important it is to watch kids around water, never break that chain of supervision, and then get kids water safe as soon as you possibly can. So that's the infant, infant and young child category. And then that gets us to the headline I read about the, the big growth in, in gun-related deaths, but also suicide. Right, but that's the older group. Older so group. so okay. you want to do the middle group first? Sure, let's okay. do the middle group first. So, yeah. the, so the, for the grade school kids, it's really motor vehicle accidents. And so that is from being not maybe kids being in the front seat, maybe not being in a car seat like they're supposed to, not being in the right kind of car seat, maybe the car seat's not installed properly. Okay. Or, and also the, some of the deaths were from, uh, you know, the, the older sibling was driving. So you have a a 17 or 18 year old driving the five year old to an appointment or something, and they have less attention to detail in the car seat, less attention to detail, they're more easily distracted and more likely to get into a car crash. So it's the, for that middle group, for the, for the grade schoolers, it's really about car safety. But the older sibling in this case has a license or someone yeah, who yeah. took so, well, okay. Okay. a license? Yeah, yeah, there's a license, but easily distracted, not paying attention. The siblings in the back, so there could be sibling like stuff going on. So you know what I mean, yeah. like distracted driving because of that. So for that grade school group, the really the dominant cause of death is really things that happen in the car, preventable with the right kind of decisions from the parents. Again, car seats, making sure they're all of them are in the back seat until they're at least 13. Right, and then I jumped ahead on the one we're going to talk about with older kids. Yeah. Right. So the adolescence is a very distinct and different group thing, things that cause preventable death. Um, the first category is firearms. And you talked about at the top how we've had a 170% increase in the last 10 years in, in gun-related deaths. And that's a combination of both homicides and suicide. But it, the common thread through both of those mm. is when parents have a pistol in their house that's not secured, that the teenager knows where it's at, and they can make impulsive decisions that end up leading to a homicide or suicide, decisions they can't take back. And adolescents' minds, their brains are not fully formed. They're, they're more impulsive than they will be as adults. And so the key takeaway here is secure your, if you have a weapon in the house, secure it, make sure it's not loaded, make sure that nobody has access to it. Um, it, it you know, and, it, and there's a policy piece to this too, yeah. because many other states have what's called a child access prevention law, which says, look, if you have a firearm in the house, we're not going to take, we're not talking about taking a firearm away, saying if there's a firearm in the house, somebody gets a hold of it, something bad happens, you are both criminally and civilly liable for what happens with that firearm, even if you didn't pull the trigger. And that changes parents' behavior. To, to secure their, now they have a different motive to lock up their firearm. And so that, there's that piece. And then the final thing is fentanyl. Yeah. I mean, they call it poisonings, but really 90% of it is fentanyl pills. And that's a different, more complicated type of intervention. Um, Policy-wise, we've well, done a good job in Arizona because 
the naloxone reversal drug is available at drug stores without a prescription now. It costs 70 bucks, so it's not free, but you know, we've done some things, and then the opioid, opioid settlement money, there's some things underway with that, too. Well, let me go back to guns briefly, though, Will, because that, again, is, is the headline that grabs things. If policies needed to change there, uh, is it even worth the effort at times, considering what state legislature we have, considering yeah. how people feel about the Second Amendment? Well, in Arizona, I, don't, I just, I mean, there will be bills this legislative session that will have a child access prevention law in it. Okay. It will not get a hearing. It will not, you won't even read about it because it won't, maybe not get it assigned to a committee even. You know, so I think eventually some, I will see the day we have a child access prevention law, I think. Um, I'm in my mid 60s. I don't know how long that's going to take, uh, but states increasingly recognize, and, and by the way, this is not a Second Amendment thing. This is a thing that says, look, you have a firearm in your house that's a deadly weapon, secure it properly, treat it with the respect that it's due. And if you don't, these are the consequences. It's about personal responsibility, which, by the way, is pretty bipartisan. Let's talk about defining preventable versus non-preventable. I mean, it should speak for itself, but right. when we put under preventable, are there any things in preventable that give you pause in any way? Well, one thing we haven't talked about that's preventable is see, prematurity is a big cause of death. Now, how do you do, how do you prevent premature? Well, it's about prenatal care and preconception health. So it's about staying healthy before you get pregnant. And then when you get pregnant, make sure that you keep all those appointments that can prevent prematurity, mm -hmm. which would then late, if you're, you know, if someone is born at 22, four, six weeks, it's, there's a good chance that baby's not going to make it. I meant to ask you very briefly on this, Will. Is it broken down to the deaths we talked about, the three categories, broken down by income level, ancestry, heritage, ethnicity, anything like that? Yeah, so the, in the, inside the report, and it's on my blog, and it's on, you can Google Child Fatality Review, 31st Annual Report. There's all kinds of demographic factors, in the, but we can't cover that in six no, minutes. Absolutely. Will Humble, <laughs> thanks as always. Good to see you. All right, take care.